Hello, my name is Barbara Leland and I do the healthy eating classes here at Hogue Cancer Center and I'm a certified holistic health coach in Huntington Beach. So today we're going to be talking about cooling down inflammation that uh, can heat us up like crazy more than the heat wave, right? So what is inflammation? There's two types. We have acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation is short in dur duration. It's um, usually severe and intense. And chronic in inflammation is continual. And it can reoccur. And it will reoccur, OK? So acute inflammation, when you break a bone, you have a cut, um, things like that, you sprain your ankle, the, the body sends the white blood cells to the injury and that helps to rebuild the tissue. And what you get is you get swelling, it gets red, it's hot. Have you ever broken a bone or sprained something and you feel it and it's like, oh my God, that's so hot. Or how about when you get a bite, a mosquito bite. We have a lot of mosquitoes lately. So a mosquito bite and you feel it and it's so hot. That's inflammation, that's, that's the um, body sending the fighters, those little white uh, blood cell soldiers, to the area to help you heal, right? But chronic inflammation is when we have a continued immune response. So your body is continually responding to things that are coming from the environment, um, physical and mental invaders, which we're going to talk about, like diet, toxic chemicals, stress. And your body can't turn off the immune response. So, so the, uh, the, that turns into an inflammatory response and it starts damaging the healthy tissue in your body. So, okay, so let's say you're out camping and you're sitting around the campfire, you're having a nice time and you're roasting marshmallows and it's a beautiful night. And then, you know, you forget to, you forget to put, dampen it when you go to bed. And a wind comes up and now you have a forest fire that's out of control. That is chronic inflammation. It's a forest fire out of control in your system. So over time, while we have this chronic inflammation, that wears out your immune system. Because think of it, you're constantly, constantly battling this, in, this, um, this invader. And so it wears you out. So when we have acute inflammation, like we said, it, that can be allergies, uh, as long as the allergies are temporary. If you have continual allergies, that can turn into chronic inflammation. Um, burns, um, reaction to chemicals, fever. These are all acute inflammation, right? They're going to stop. It's going to stop when, you're, when you've cured it, the broken bone, etc. Chronic inflammation is in the form of cardiovascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, neurological disease, and cancer. So acute inflammation is helpful. Chronic inflammation is no bueno. So how do you know if you have chronic inflammation? The very best way, you know, we can guess, we can doctor Google it, but the very best way is to ask your doctor because there are really just a couple of, there are a couple of easy tests that they can run to check your inflammation levels. They can test for the C-reactive protein, which is CRP, levels that are produced by the liver, and they can test the, um, the amount you have. When you have inflammation, the CRP levels rise. And then they can also test how quickly the red blood cells settle in a test tube. And the faster they settle, um, the more inflammation you have. So not that you care about what kind of blood tests they run, but just so you know, ask your doctor. Your doctor knows what to do about checking for inflammation, and then you can figure out what to do about it, right? So here's some possible symptoms. But remember, these symptoms can also be indicators of something else. When you have any of these symptoms and you feel like you might have inflammation, chronic inflammation, check with your doctor and let them get, you know, test for it. So aches and pains. You feel achy all the time, all the time. Your joints, your body uh, is probably inflamed. 
um, fibromyalgia and arthritis are classic symptoms. So yeah, that is a, that is a symptom definitely of chronic inflammation. Um, but general aches and pains also can be an indicator of uh, inflammation. And then fatigue, uh, we talked about this before, how your immune system can be worn out, but it causes your whole body to be worn out. Think about it when you're sick and you have the flu and your body is fighting that, 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 um, that flu, right? You're exhausted. You're exhausted when you have the flu. It's the same thing when your body is fighting chronic inflammation. You're exhausted. I mean, you may not be as exhausted as the flu, but you're tired, you're fatigued often. So um, it's a natural consequence, and that is you know, a good indication that there might be something going on. Check with your doctor. Red or itchy skin. Now, I'm not talking about an allergic reaction unless it's a continuous allergic reaction. But red or itchy skin on a regular basis all the time, that can be, it can be allergies, or it can be an autoimmune disease or a distressed liver. So if your liver is distressed, you're going to have higher, um, higher levels of the CRP also. So a good indication of inflammation, chronic inflammation. And just, just so you understand the difference, we're not talking about, you know, you touch some poison oak. That's an allergic reaction. Then your skin gets red and itchy, yes. Or even if you eat something and you have a reaction, that's an allergy. We're talking about when your skin is continuously red or itchy and you have blotches and you don't know what they're caused from. You need to contact your doctor. Uh, gut issues. So inflammatory bowel disease obviously is um, chronic inflammation. It's right in the name. That It's kind of a big clue. And the two most common types of that are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So Crohn's disease uh, is inflammation in any part of the digestive tract. But ulcerative colitis is inflammation of the large intestine. So your gut is a really important um, partner <laughs> of your health. So you want to keep your, your gut healthy to to fight off or to keep you from having inflammation. And we'll talk more about that later. But what causes chronic inflammation? Here are just some examples. Untreated acute inflammation. So let's say you have uh, an allergic reaction and you don't, and you continue to have that allergic reaction on, you know, constantly. That can cause the, your body to go into chronic inflammation, okay? Um, if, you, if you have some of these symptoms that we're talking about and if they're caused by acute inflammation and you don't do anything about them, they can turn into chronic inflammation. So untreated acute inflammation. Not so much like if you break a bone, because even if you break a bone and you don't get it set, which I can't imagine you would do, but let's say you didn't get your bone set, your bone will repair itself. You won't have chronic inflammation from something like that, most likely, but something else, such as the things that we've been talking about. And then autoimmune disease is um, uh, a, um, a cause, and that would be psoriasis, um, thyroid disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus, okay? Um, celiac disease. So celiac disease is a cause of chronic inflammation. And then prolonged exposure to toxins, pollution, uh, industrial chemicals. If you're pesticides, cigarette smoke, it could be your cigarette smoke, I hope not, or it could be someone else's cigarette smoke, I hope not also. Um, household chemicals, personal product chemicals, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But just realize that your body is getting exposed to these toxins, and if you're exposed on a regular basis over and over and over again, it's going to take effect. And that effect is going to be in the form of chronic inflammation, and chronic inflammation will lead to disease. So you want to limit your exposure to toxins as much as possible. If you're working in a, if you live or work in a place where there's a lot of pollution, you want to make sure that you 
get a good air purifier. Um, when you're working with chemicals, make sure you have good, good masks and, and gloves. Uh, when you're working with household chemicals, uh, cleaning the house, hopefully you're not using harsh chemicals in your house, but if you are, I know it's hard to just do vinegar and baking soda. It doesn't always do the trick. But the more you can avoid household chemicals in the form of cleaning products, the better off you're going to be. And if you're using household chemicals, such as bleach and other items that are strong and caustic, then you want to make sure you have gloves on, you have a mask on. Don't just be, oh, I can take it. No, you can't. You can't. And make sure that when you're doing that, you've, you're protected. And then continue to protect yourself by putting a fan on in that room, opening the windows, leaving the area. Let that dissipate because that, when you come back and you start breathing that, those fumes in, it's still damaging you. It's going into your system. And personal products, um, you're, gonna, you're like, I don't use personal product chemicals. Yes, you probably do. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, but you wanna limit your exposure to these tox toxins. And then alcohol, excessive alcohol consumption, that creates havoc in your, in your gut. So the microbiome is damaged by excessive alcohol consumption. In, it impairs the liver's ability to detoxify. So the liver, that is what the liver does, right? The liver cleans out everything. Everything goes through the liver. The liver cleans it out, returns the blood, right? When you have alcohol, excessive alcohol consumption, it impairs the liver's ability to do that. And so those bacterial products aren't filtered out of your body, and so they get recycled back into your body. Your body is continuing to fight those, those bacterial products or items, and so you have chronic inflammation. Your immune system is constantly trying to correct it, okay? Then it also impairs the brain's ability to regulate inflammation. So remember that we have a, um, a gut-brain connection, right? And when things go wrong in our body, it affects our brain as well. When our brain can't regulate what our body is doing on inflammation, it's going to go chronic, right? So we want to make sure that we keep our body clean and we don't do excessive alcohol consumption. Um, being overweight, especially in the middle section, so that when you're, when you're overweight in your stomach area, in your, your chest area, that's the fat that's surrounding your organs. So the immune system sees these fat cells, and then it sees these fat cells as a threat, and it attacks them with those white blood cell soldiers, right? So you're constantly having an immune response to being overweight. And then the longer you're overweight, the longer your body stays in a state of inflammation. And I see I have a question. And if you have questions, um, as you now know, you can go ahead and type them in the chat. And probably you already knew that. <laughs> All right. Um, recently had, I recently had pre-op blood work done. Both my red and white blood cell count were low. Could that be due to inflammation? Well, it could. You need to talk to your doctor about that. Because again, there's, a, there's an easy test to be done for that. Um, and I don't know what else you have going on that's causing your white and, and red blood cell count to be low. Maybe you're on some treatment that could be affecting your blood cell count. So do talk to your doctor about that and, um, and, and see why, why is your red and white blood cell count low. But yes, it could be. Good question. Good luck on your hip replacement. Okay, um, okay, so the longer you're overweight, the longer your body is inflamed. And then we want to exercise. You know, we're always hearing, exercise is good for you, exercise is good for you. It is good for you, but you don't want to exercise too much, and you don't want to exercise not enough. So when we exercise, so for example, we're lifting weights, right? You know when you're lifting weights, what you're doing is you're breaking down the muscle, the cells in the muscle, right? 
And the whole point of lifting weights is to break down the cells so that they rebuild stronger. But we're always told that we're supposed to do um, uh, weights, wait 48 hours before we do them again. If we continue to do, bef to continue to exercise or over-exercise over what our body's level is used to, and we continue to break down those cells, the body is constantly trying to repair that. So you see, with no recovery, it can become inflammatory. But if you don't exercise, that's even more dangerous for chronic inflammation. So when we sit all the time, that's the new smoking, right? Um, so ideally, you want to have a physical activity, allow your body to recover. You want to have physical activity on, uh, like on an everyday basis where your body can, it's within your levels. You want to not over push your body on a regular basis. You need to allow your body to recover. You also don't want to go and walk five miles in the morning and then sit the rest of the day because that five miles is great, that was great, but the sitting the rest of the day is a problem. So you have a Fitbit? Set your Fitbit to remind you. That's part of the app. It will remind you to get up and move uh, every hour. Um, if you don't have a Fitbit, you know, do it on your phone. You can set it on your phone to remind you to get up and move every hour. If you don't have a Fitbit or a phone, still no excuse. Get an alarm. <laughs> you know, set your timer. Whatever you want to do to remind you, because let's face it, we're sitting at the computer or whatever we're doing, reading a book or watching TV. Sitting at, mine is the computer. So I'm sitting at the computer doing whatever I'm doing, my work. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, it's three, four hours later and I'm still sitting at the computer. No, we got to get up. My Fitbit says, hey, get up. And I do. I get up, I make a tea, I walk around, I do whatever. But I get up and you don't have to go out and do exercise at that point. Just make sure you're moving your body, okay? And then chronic stress. When we get stressed out, or when we get stress put into us, we, our cortisol rises. Now cortisol is necessary, and it is our friend. It's anti-inflammatory, when it's at normal levels. But when cortisol is released, and what it was, released, you know, what it was designed for is fight or flight, so when we're being chased by a tiger, the cortisol is going to be released. And that's good because you need to fight or flight. You know, hopefully flight if you're being chased by a tiger. But when that continues over and over and over again, when you have constant stress coming in, your cortisol is always increased. And when you have elevated cortisol, that suppresses the body's immune system it affects your adrenal glands, and it makes your body more susceptible to colds, infections, allergies, cancer, autoimmune disease, etc. cetera. It's, it's your body's in chronic, chronic stress causes chronic inflammation, okay? So we need to learn how to deal with that because we can't control the stress that's coming into our, into our realm. And then poor nutrition, which is the brunt of what we're going to talk about today. Um, what you eat affects the levels of the CRP in your blood. So processed sugar, saturated fats, and other things. Those are all, your body doesn't see that as nutrition. It sees it as a threat. So that raises the risk of chronic inflammation. So can you imagine your body is seeing the food you're putting into it as a threat? But other foods that are nutritious, like fruits and veggies, those aren't seen as a threat, and they help your, um, your body fight against uh, oxidative stress. So antioxidant, right? Uh, and, that, and the oxidative stress is what triggers inflammation and causes disease, including cancer. Um, OK, so how do we put the brakes on this and put it in reverse? We want an anti-inflammatory diet. We want to address gut issues. We want to avoid toxins and pollutants. We want to exercise, but within our limits. And we want to learn stress management. 
just to recap. So here is a chart. Here are a couple of charts. One is the anti-inflammatory diet. And that was created by Dr. Andrew Weil. And you may have heard of him. I'm sure you have. Um, and he created this anti-inflammatory diet. Now, I put up the Mediterranean diet because I wanted you to see how closely related they are. If you are eating a Mediterranean diet, you are pretty much getting an anti-inflammatory diet as well. Um, there are a couple of differences, but they're very similar. Now, this may be hard for you, especially if you're on your phone, you probably can't see this at all. But if you're looking at your computer, you might be able to read this. But there is a link um, under the YouTube box that you can uh, download the slides if you want to look at this later. So um, the biggest takeaway on the anti-inflammatory diet and the Mediterranean diet is look at the proportion of plant-based foods, OK? The biggest proportion of your diet should be plant-based foods. I'm not saying you should be vegan. I'm not saying you even should be vegetarian necessarily. It's up to you. But what you want to make sure is that you have mostly plant-based foods in your diet. So, oh, eat a mostly plant-based diet. So the plants are, plant foods are the only foods um, that have phytonutrients. So phytonutrients are anti-inflammatory. And these are the phytonutrients, phytochemicals, same thing, are the things in a plant that a plant produces to protect the plant against invaders, bugs, viruses, um, bacteria. These, these plants produce their own phytonutrients to protect themselves from these invaders. When we eat those plants that contain these phytonutrients, we're also getting the benefit of those, that protection. So that's how that works. I, I just think that is just amazing that a plant can grow and have this protection in the plant, and it's right there for us. It's just right at our fingertips, right? Um, so also, they're high in antioxidants, and they're high in fiber. And um, antioxidants, you know, is good for oxidative stress, which causes cancer and other diseases. And fiber can lower your levels of CRP, among other things, keeps our body clean. So the American Institute for Cancer Research recommends at least two-thirds of your plate should be plant foods. Okay, they're not saying to be a vegetarian or a vegan. Don't worry. <laughs> but you could be. But um, they're saying at least two-thirds of your plate. Of that two-thirds, of that two-thirds, one half of your plate should be non-starchy vegetables and fruits and or fruits of, you know, all color, all eat the rainbow, right? The, a quarter of your plate should be whole grains or starchy vegetables. Um, um, sorry, I got distracted because I'm getting some questions here. Um, a quarter of your plate should be whole grains and starchy vegetables, um, brown rice, uh, uh, quinoa, potatoes, corn and peas. You don't want you don't want two-thirds of your diet to be starchy vegetables. You want two-thirds of your plate, plate to be plant-based, but of that, you only want, um, you only want one, um, one half of your plate is non-starchy vegetables, OK? One quarter of your plate is the whole starchy vegetables. OK, you can have more than one half of your plate be non-starchy vegetables, but at least one half. And then remember that animal-based foods can trigger chronic inflammation. Okay, some animal-based foods can trigger chronic inflammation. I'm going to go to these questions. So what's the best ratio of red and white meat per week? I don't understand that question. Red meat um, per week? I would not indulge in red wheat meat per week. I would try to limit that. I believe the, um, the pyramid said per month if you're going to have red meat. I think that's what it said. Uh, white meat, I'm assuming that means like lean chicken or things like that. Um, if you're going to have animal products, check out that the, the two um, 
the two pyramids and make your decision based on that. If you're going to be having meat, I personally would rather see you not have uh, the lean meats more than once a week um, and maybe less than that. But you have to eat the diet that works for you too. So uh, the red meat, I could see you never have it. Um, the white meat, uh, limit it to like once a week. And try to substitute with, with fish, um, as we'll, we'll go on and see. Okay, here's another question. If you have chronic stress for an extended period and then the stress finally ends, how long does it take for your body to repair the damage? It, it depends on the damage that's been done. I don't know. So um, it really, it, that's, it depends on how deeply your, your body has been damaged from the stress. If you have gotten one of, one of these diseases that we're talking about, it's not, it, it may not just take an apple, right? So it depends on what has occurred in your body and what you're doing for it. Some things, you know, as cancer, right? We're not going to just eat an apple and the cancer is going to go away. So it depends on the extent of the damage. I hope that answers the question. Um, if not, you can contact me at my email um, later, uh, later on after, you know, next week or whatever. Okay. Eat more fermented foods. So fermented foods are very important. We had a, a seminar, I don't know, a few months ago or several months ago about the gut microbiome. And fermented foods are very important for nourishing the gut microbiome. So we want to keep our, our microbiome healthy. And fermented foods like yogurt and sauerkraut and miso, they all contain probiotics. And that nourishes the gut microbiome and reduces inflammation. So it doesn't have to be, if you're having yogurt, it doesn't have to be milk yogurt. It can be milk alternative yogurt. But just be careful, when you're buying milk alternative yogurt in the store, when something has been created to be something else, they're not gonna, it's not going to sell if it doesn't taste like the something else, right? Or feel like the something else. So if you bought a almond milk yogurt and it was runny or not creamy enough, you're probably not going to want it, right? So they're going to add things into that often. They're going to add things into the alternative milks. I'm not saying alternative milks aren't good. I'm just saying that they will possibly put things into those alternative milks to make them act like the thing they're trying to be, be it yogurt or ice cream or even uh, just the milk. So what do you do about it? Well, you look for the best brand that you can find or you make your own. And you're like, yeah, right. But no, it's not that hard. <laughs> so if you have questions about that, let me know. Um, other, other items that you could have that are not dairy are sauerkraut and miso. And we had a seminar, well, in that, in that gut microbiome, we, we made a, um, a type of kimchi. Uh, it was more of a me Mexican style kimchi, but you, know, you can do whatever flavors you like. But when you're fermenting these foods, and you can buy uh, fermented kimchi and, and sauerkraut already, already made. I advise you to buy it in glass, not in plastic. Um, it's great if you can make it. It's really easy, really, really easy. It just takes a little patience. So these are all fermented foods that you can, you can uh, use to, to nourish the microbiome. Also, uh, miso soup. Uh, Miso soup, miso is a great fermented product. The problem with miso soup, not a problem, but the problem with how we prepare it is that when we cook the soup with the miso, then it, it kills the fermentation. So what you want to do is when you're having, when you're going to make some miso soup, simmer your vegetables, your whatever, in, that, in your water, broth, whatever you're using. When that's done, turn it off then put in the miso and mix it all together, then you're not going to cook the miso, you're not going to kill the fermentation. Um, uh, kombucha, if you haven't tried kombucha, it's a really delicious 
um, drink. It's made with a probiotic mother, they call it. And what that, it's like apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is made with a, a mother also. It's, a, it's the, the part that ferments the product, the item. And um, watch the sugar on the kombucha because there are some brands that it turns into like a soda pop. And then there's some brands that are really much better. Um, they do put a little sugar. You do have to have some sugar to get that fermentation process going in the kombucha. But you're, you'll see on different brands, you know, you might have four grams of sugar and you might have 18 grams of sugar. So you want to be careful there. Um, on that sauerkraut and kimchi, you're like, ooh, I don't want to. Try it on your sandwich or in a salad. Maybe you don't want to just eat it like, just like that. But mix it into something else, and it'll give foods flavor, and, um, and you'll be getting the benefit. What about you have like a vegetable soup, and then it's all cooked and everything, and then just at the end, you put some sauerkraut or some kimchi, or if you like the spice, I advise to go to the kimchi, nice and spicy. Um, and then you're not really tasting the, the, the sauerkraut or kimchi so much, and you're, you're tasting your soup, but it enhances the flavor, and you're getting those probiotics. Okay, if you have any questions about that, let me know. You want to balance your fatty acids. So we're talking about omega-3s here and omega-6. In the standard American diet, we have far more omega-6 than omega-3. That's inflammatory. Omega-6 comes in the form of um, uh, uh, bad fats, okay? Um, you want to make sure you have good fats, good fats to, in, to in reduce your inflammation. Good fats are going to be um, uh, salmon, tuna, but watch the mercury, right? You don't want to have tuna all the time. Halibut, uh, flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, pecans, avocado, all of those have omega-3s. So if you're vegan, vegetarian, or you just don't want to eat fish too much because of the mercury, you can get your omega-3s in a vegetarian or vegan way. The difference is when you're eating flax seeds, chia, walnuts, etc., that is in the form of ALA. ALA is not as easily absorbed in the body, sorry, as um, the form that, and I can't remember the initials, E something, the form that is with uh, the seafood. So seafood, when you're eating omega-3s in the form of seafood, that's totally absorbed into the body. When you're eating it in the form of the vegetarian um, substances, that you have to eat more to get the same benefit, okay? Now, and maybe you're taking supplements for omega-3. Be careful with that because you don't know how much should you be taking. You don't know... Where is, what is the source of this omega-3 that I'm getting? There's a lot of things you may not know when you're doing uh, supplements, right? And I know that we, we go out and we get supplements and we think everything's great, but you have to have some education behind that. Um, also, when you're doing supplements, check with your doctor if you're doing any kind of treatment or whatever because there could be some contraindications. Um, also, uh, when you have, there's one other, there's a vegetarian option for omega-3, which is uh, sea vegetables. And sea vegetables will absorb directly into your body, just like uh, the fish does. So that's a good source of omega-3. Sea vegetables being seaweed and things like that. Turmeric and ginger are both anti-inflammatory, and they're also antioxidant, and they work great together. So they're available raw as a root, and they're located in the produce section. You see the diff, they look alike. Uh, they look like almost exactly alike, but the inside, the, the turmeric is orange and the ginger is yellow. So you can see on this picture the difference in the colors. Um, when you're doing, you can also find it in powdered form, like in, so for when, when you're cooking, you can grate it into your cooking. Um, next week, we're going to do a, a recipe that uses turmeric and ginger that will show you how to make uh, a tea out of turmeric and ginger. 
And, but in a powdered form, you can use it when you're sauteing vegetables, when you're um, making stews, when you're, really when you're doing just about anything. You can add them into baked goods, etc. okay? Turmeric needs to have black pepper in order to be absorbed. Um, when, we, when we don't have the black pepper, you're still going to get a little bit of the benefit, but it's not going to be well absorbed without the black pepper. There's uh, curcumin in the black pepper, and that's what helps the turmeric absorb. Also, healthy fat helps the absorption of the turmeric. And remember, these are not, this is not a medication. This is a natural product, a natural substance. It's not going to work overnight. You didn't get inflammation overnight, so you're, you're not going to feel the full effect of having natural um, remedies overnight as well. Okay, turmeric and ginger should be working. You should feel, feel some effects from that after about eight weeks. Could be less. So how about uh, supplements? Ask your doctor. So there are some problems, there could be some problems with supplements for turmeric and ginger. Uh, both of them, uh, if you're pregnant especially, you want to check with your doctor. If you're diabetic and you're taking medications and you're thinking about taking ginger and turmeric supplements, realize that, that, that they both reduce your blood sugar levels. That's good, that's not a bad thing. But if you're taking um, medication, you don't want to start passing out, right? Where your blood sugar level drops too low. So check with your doctor if you want to take supplements on that. Also gallstones, um, don't use the supplements, uh, bile duct dysfunction don't use them. And if you're having any kind of surgery, don't take supplements two weeks prior because it could promote bleeding. And, um, and if you have liver disease, check with your doctor for uh, supplements, uh, for contraindications for turmeric supplements, okay? Then other beneficial herbs and spices, so garlic, Garlic can be used ex internally and externally. And for example, if you have some kind of, if you have a cut or a, uh, my son had, when he was in wrestling, he got, all the boys got these uh, warts, wart-like things on their skin from, I guess the other boys sweat, I don't know. But I took garlic and honey and I put it on top of his area covered it up, it was gone in a week. The other boys all took antibiotics, it was also gone in a week. Which would you rather use? Okay, so you can use garlic uh, internally and externally for inflammation and for um, your immunity. Chili peppers, good for your immunity, good for anti-inflammatory. Basil, all varieties, holy basil is great, but all varieties, all varieties will help you. Uh, use it fresh because when they dry out the basil, then it reduces some of the, a lot of the beneficial properties. Cinnamon, cinnamon's good for inflammation, cinnamon's good for blood sugar, cinnamon's good for a lot of things, but you want to have the right kind of cinnamon, and that's Ceylon cinnamon. Um, and if you want to know where you can get Ceylon cinnamon, they have it at Whole Foods, I believe they have it at Sprouts, they have it at Spice Stores. They may have it in the regular market, I'm not sure. Um, but what we normally get when it says cinnamon on the shelf is usually Saigon cinnamon, which is delicious, and it's stronger than Ceylon cinnamon. Ceylon cinnamon is, is um, less powerful tasting, but it's more powerful acting, okay? So Ceylon cinnamon is what you want to use. Uh, rosemary, and you can uh, use that also internally and externally, internally as far as in your foods, externally in the form of essential oil. You can use the essential oil in your foods too if it's pure essential oil. Okay, so those are some herbs and spices we can use to help us with inflammation. And then tea is great for inflammation, black, green, white, herbal, and um, all of them reduce inflammation and there's different properties in each one and how they reduce inflammation. But peppermint tea is also antibacterial and antiviral uh, as well as anti-inflammatory. Um, uh, Rosehip tea, chamomile tea is great for um, inflammation. It also 
has an antioxidants and also it's very calming so that can help you with stress and ashwagandha ashwagandha helps with inflammation by helping your it supports your adrenal glands and it lowers your cortisol levels so again that helps ashwagandha is great if you are in stressful situations ashwagandha tea can help you with that and more <laughs> but wait there's more <laughs> oops so what do we want to avoid? We want to avoid processed foods. We want to avoid fast foods, which are always processed foods. Um, unless you're making <laughs> fast food at home, right? Which isn't fast food at all. It's just fast, but it's good for you. But fast food out is not good for you. So packaged foods, instant foods, sodas, deli meats, all of these, all of these are not just lower in nutrients, but they're higher in refined sugars, refined flours, saturated and trans fats and artificial ingredients. And if you remember what I said before, the body sees that coming into your system. It's like, what the heck is that? And goes to attack it as if it, as if it needs to increase its um, immune system, right? Unhealthy fats, we already talked about, that are high in omega-6. Uh, canola oil, I know canola oil is in so many things, but canola oil is inflammatory. Um, and you need to watch out for that. It's cheap. That's why it's in so many things. Uh, soybean oil also is cheap, very cheap. And both of those items are usually GMO. So you want to watch out for that. Um, uh, vegetable shortenings and margarines. And then also, you're going to find these fats in most of your snack foods and your cookies, crackers, sweets. And again, more refined sugars and refined carbohydrates. None of that is good for you, right? None of it. So let's say, okay, I'm going to have, uh, I'm not going to have sugar. I'm going to have aspartame or whatever. But your body can't process artificial sweeteners. So again, you get this taste of sweetness in your mouth. Your body doesn't recognize it. Because when you get sweetness in your mouth, what happens is your body starts to process your system to accept and process that sugar. It increases your insulin, you know, and, and a regular, on a regular body that doesn't have diabetes, the insulin rises, meets the sugar, takes care of it, and the insulin lowers, right? When you have artificial sweeteners, the body doesn't recognize it. It triggers an immune response. Again, it sends out those little white blood cell soldiers, and that leads to inflammation. If you're having soda every day, like diet sodas or diet to something else or whatever with artificial sweeteners, yogurts, I've seen yogurts with artificial sweeteners, sugar-free, sugar-free, right? But it's not, it's still sweet. So if it's still sweet and it's artificial sweeteners, what's going to happen? You're going to get an immune response. Some things, for example, stevia does not create that immune response. Um, but when you're talking about aspartame or Zacharin, of course, or uh, some of the other ones I can't even think of right now. We've done that in our sugar seminar. Um, that's going to trigger immune response in your system. And on a regular basis, you have that every day, every day, every day, you're going to have chronic inflammation. And then you want to make sure you read your labels. And don't be fooled by marketing, because we all are a product of marketing, right? Me too. Me too. I go to the store, I see something in brown, like, brown paper packaging. I'm like, oh, that must be natural, right? Because it's packaged so nice. It's, it's not glossy. It's like brown paper. Uh, or from the farm. Or um, it says all natural. Not necessarily. Front, front label marketing is not um, regulated the same as the ingredients and the um, uh, the ingredient and the back, the nutrition information. So when you have that front, they can't be totally lying, but they can, it can deceive you, right? Gluten-free, it's gluten-free, it must be good. Not necessarily. Have you turned over that package of gluten-free bread you have in your cupboard and seen what's in there? Take a look at those chemicals that they use to make something into something it isn't, and be careful. If you don't know what that item is, you know, that's on that label, don't buy it. Just buy things that you know that you can identify and know that they're good for you, okay? 
You don't want preservatives and stabilizers. You don't want artificial colors and refined sugar. You don't want high fructose corn syrup. You don't want unhealthy fats. You don't want carrageenan. Carrageenan is a thickener that's used quite often in dairy products. And I hate to say it, Trader Joe's has a lot of dairy products with carrageenan in it. Carrageenan is inflammatory, okay? Oh, what about stevia? I just answered that. I, I, did you hear me when I said that? Uh, stevia, for some reason, does not cause an inflammatory response. Maybe because stevia is a plant, so your body recognizes it as a true food. Because um, what stevia is, is a plant. It's just a plant. If you go and you look at a stevia plant and you break a leaf off, I did this once, and then you dab it on your tongue, you're going to get a sweet taste. It is a plant, and that is a natural food. So I guess that's why stevia doesn't get a response the way the other things do. Your body's pretty smart. Avoid environmental toxins. So we don't have, like I said, we don't have control over everything. But if we um, can control the things that we do have control over, we're going to be way ahead. And you know, take the precautions, like I said before, when you're dealing with chemicals. But Pesticides are something we really want to watch out for. And if you go to ewg.org, that can give you information about the Dirty Dozen. You've probably heard of this, the Dirty Dozen. It lists the 12 foods every year that are the worst for pesticide load. Um, and the Clean 15, every year it changes. They may be the same, but every year they update their list and things change. And you want to make sure that you stay far away from the things that are on the dirty dozen. And um, uh, keep, in, keep in mind that if you, you know, some things go on sale, et cetera, at the market, make sure they're on the clean 15 if they're not organic or pesticide free. Pesticide free is OK, too, at the farmer's market, OK? Um, OK. And then household and personal toxins, we talked about this just a few minutes ago, uh, but we want to be careful about what we're using in our house and on our skin. And EWG.org also has Skin Deep um, on their website. Click on Skin Deep or Guide to Endocrine Disruptors, and both of those things will tell you different. You can look up the products that you're using and see just how bad, or maybe they're OK. Um, by going to this website, okay, ewg.org. I love them. I think they're a great organization, um, so I use them a lot. What about non-fruit sweetener? Non-fruit sweetener. Non-fruit sweetener? I don't know what that is. <laughs> What's a non-fruit sweetener? Put something more in the chat so I have a I have an idea what a non-fruit sweetener is. OK. Um, get off your bum, OK? Don't sit down. Look, I've been sitting here for, sorry, we're, we're going a little over, over our time today. But I've been sitting here for 45 minutes. I'm going to have to get up in 15 minutes and walk around, right? Um, you want to be physically active at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week, at least. That's minimal. Also, after your physical activity, after you're working out, after your nice, good walk, or run, or swim, or bike ride, or whatever, don't sit on the couch. Get up and move around every hour, OK? Remember to set your alarm, or your Fitbit, or your phone, or your whatever. And then the stress, you know, just lighten up. Because they did a study, and they found that people who can't be calm this was Penn State. They found that people who can't be calm when dealing with everyday stress have elevated CPR. It wasn't the frequency of the stress coming in that had the greatest impact. It was the dealing with it. It was the individual's response to the stress coming in. So maybe you say, oh, I have too much stress, so I can't help it. Well. The more you have coming in, of course, yeah, it's going to be more difficult. But your response to that stress is what's going to help you. So things that help you deal with stress, laugh. 
lighten up, right? We are so darn serious. And there's so much negativity going around. Get together with your friends and laugh. Don't talk so much about the news. Don't talk. We've got to know what's going on. I agree. We've got to know what's going on. But make sure you have enough happiness in your life and enough joy that you can handle the other not so great stuff, right? Um, have you ever heard of laughter yoga? That I thought when I heard laughter yoga, I thought there is no way, that's not gonna work. It totally works. When people around you start to laugh, pretty soon you just can't help it. You start to laugh. I have seen a couple of people who didn't laugh. I don't know what would make them laugh. Um, <laughs> watch a funny movie. Uh, do things with your friends and just enjoy your life. Because if you're not enjoying your life, what the heck is the point, right? What is the point? So lighten it up. Also, meditate. Um, stressed out adults who practiced meditation on a regular basis have reduced levels of inflammation, okay? So, okay, we can't, uh, we can't help. Our boss is yelling at us. There's traffic on the freeway. Our kids are driving us crazy. We can't help it. It's happening. But deal with it. Okay, find a way to let yourself lighten up. And I have a couple more questions. I have a cup of diet soda daily with lunch. I should buy regular soda instead? No, <laughs> but I'll get to that. I was concerned about the sugar, but looks like I shouldn't. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not laughing at you, I'm laughing with you, because that is a difficult situation, right? It's like, I like soda, I wanna have soda with my lunch, so now what, you're telling me to have the sugar? No, I'm not telling you to have the sugar, I'm telling you to not have the soda, okay? Honestly, the soda has enough chemicals in it, sugar or no sugar, that you're gonna be having an inflammation response. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So I'm sorry to say, you need to find a beverage that isn't soda. It's just junk. Try kombucha, okay? Try some kombucha and see how you like it. Um, you don't want the sugar, you're right. You don't want the diet sugar, you're right there too, but you don't want the soda. And I'm, I'm sorry to just be like, just black and white on that, but that really is, a, that's like smoking. You don't want to smoke either, even if it's, you know, light cigarettes, okay? How do I feel about eating organic chicken and grass-fed organic beef, veal, lamb? I am Whole Foods plant-based vegan, just came on. Hello, <laughs> welcome. Um, so I personally don't eat chicken or beef or veal or lamb. I personally don't. But how I feel and what I had said before was I'd rather not see you eat any red meat and if you're going to eat a white meat, a question had come up that if you're going to eat white meat, how often? I would limit that to once a week. Be careful when you know what your um, labels are when you're, when you're eating grass-fed or free-range or et cetera. You can go online and look up what those labels actually mean because unless they're certified humane, you're not maybe getting the, uh, the bang for your buck, okay? So I would like you to, I would love it if no one ate meat. I would love that, but that's not the world. So if you're going to eat red meat, I'd limit that to once a month if you can. If you're going to eat chicken once a week, uh, if you want to eat fish, a couple times a week, um, and if you don't want to eat any of those, by all means, enjoy your whole food plant-based diet, but make sure you know what you're doing, because there are things, there are B12, for example, I'm sure you know that you can't get when you have a vegan diet. Um, and you have to be careful with the omega-3s. You have to figure out a way to increase the omega-3s that you're getting so that your body is going to absorb all of it. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, let's move on. And we wanna sleep, but not too much. So when we're sleeping, our body is restoring our cells. 
uh, mostly seven to eight hours of sleep a night, but that doesn't mean seven to eight hours of, of bed, right? I have learned so much about my sleeping habits um, by my Fitbit. I'm not a, I'm not a, a representative for Fitbit by any means. There are other forms of sleep monitors that you can use, but seven to eight hours of, uh, seven to eight hours in your bed is not necessarily seven to eight hours of sleep, as I have found out. But, you know, figure seven to eight hours, okay? If you sleep more than that, if you really sleep more than that, more than nine hours is, is considered excessive. And that can also lead to increased inflammation. So seven to eight hours of sleep is good for repairing, restoring, and letting your body come back to the way it should be, but don't do it too much. Just like your exercise, right? Moderation, you, you want, every, in your food too, moderation. Don't stress so much about your food. Enjoy what you're doing, enjoy what you're eating, just don't eat crap. So it's your choice, it's our choice, right? We have the choice and our lifestyle choices impact our health. We have total control over most of these choices in our life and, um, and control for prevention and treatment of inflammation. But it's not, I'm not saying it's like easy. I'm not saying like Nike, just do it. No, it's, it's not necessarily that easy when you are just starting out. But believe me, once you start looking at it in a different way, and you start realizing that what you're doing is for your body and it's only you're the one that's going to be uh, benefiting from it right you start looking at things in a different way and pretty soon it starts becoming a lifestyle it's not a diet it's a lifestyle and that makes a huge difference on your health um, can I recommend a good probiotic you mean like a supplement um, if you mean like a supplement, I only take a probiotic supplement when something has happened for myself. That's how I do it. Sorry, I keep touching the microphone, so you're probably hearing all kinds of noise. Um, but the one I take is called BioK, and that's if, if I've had to take an antibiotic for some reason, which I never do, but you know, once in a great blue moon. I have had to take an antibiotic or uh, food poisoning or something like that. Something happens that throws me out of balance, that I need quick help, I'll take BioK. That's what I use. Um, I would prefer you have your probiotic in the form of fermented foods that you eat on a regular basis. I hope that answers the question. I don't really have a recommendation for a lot of different probiotics, supplements. Um, how about eggs and egg whites? Uh, okay, eggs and egg whites are, I believe they're listed under the, um, on the inflammatory diet, I believe they're listed closer to the top rather than the bottom. And I, I would use those as a meat uh, not meat, but uh, like a lean protein type of um, uh, substitute. Not substitute, you know what I'm saying. When we're looking at eating lean proteins, eggs might be in that category. I think that's on the uh, Mediterranean diet, you'll see that. And uh, egg whites, the only problem I have with egg whites instead of just eating eggs is that you're separating out if you're going to eat an egg, you're, you have the whole egg. There's a pro Thank you. Okay, so eggs, yeah, eggs on the um, Mediterranean diet are quite high. Uh, they're on the weekly um, category. And on the anti-inflammatory diet, um, that's even small for me. I can't see it. But I would say where the lean proteins are, that's where you would put your eggs. Okay, if you're going to eat eggs. And again, oh, I do see it. Okay, so it's, it's almost in the same place as the Mediterranean diet. So do that maybe weekly, but um, uh, 
when you're separating it out, you're separating out, whenever you separate out something from itself, you're, you're, you're taking the properties and just applying it to that portion of what you're having. I don't know that egg whites is as much of a problem as other things that we separate out, like juicing. I'm not crazy about fruit juicing because of the sugar content we get. I think egg whites are probably fine. Um, thank you. Are probably fine when you eat them in a um, in the balance that we're talking about here. Okay. Any other questions? If you have any other questions and you think of them later, you can email me at to life to health at hotmail.com and um, I love to hear your questions really don't feel like you're uh, bothering me and then next week we're going to come back and we're going to make some items with turmeric and with ginger and see how we can incorporate some of that into our into our life are there any other questions doesn't look like it I'm going to give it a second they're saying can suggest anything for fibroids and cystic breasts. Um, well, mm, that, that is an inflammatory situation. So I don't have anything specific for that. Um, so no, I don't have anything specific for that. And it really depends on your situation. So if you, you know, there's hormones involved and uh, fibroids, especially with hormones, that would be something that would be more more specific to each individual, and I think that I'd like to look at your diet before I venture to guess on that. Okay? Anything else? All right. I will see you next week, and we'll have a cooking demo. And I'm sorry I went so long. I didn't realize I'd be this long. So thank you for hanging in there. Okay? And I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.